Hello, everyone. I'd like to speak with you today about the decision to approve the Trans Mountain Pipeline. Both Burnaby and North Vancouver each have a significant stake in this decision. Indeed, our community is arguably the most impacted community in Canada. This has been demonstrated by how vigorously many of our neighbours have engaged in the decision-making process over the last number of years. When I first ran for office, I promised to be a strong voice for our community in Ottawa and to bring innovative and entrepreneurial thinking to the decision-making process. With this in mind, I'd like to share with you how we have organized our time and resources over the last year in order to make sure we deliver on that promise. To determine how we prioritize our time, we developed four non-policy and four policy priorities. The four non-policy priorities include uh, making sure my wife is happy. I like to say that uh, my wife is number one and Canada is number two, and really, that's putting Canada number one because I'm a better member of Parliament with her support. Uh, the second is to stay healthy. Again, a better representative if I can do that. The third was to learn French, and the fourth was to be a strong constituency MP who is a strong voice for our community in Ottawa. Based on 50,000 door knocks and 25,000 phone calls, we picked our policy priorities for the first year. Strong advocacy on behalf of the community on the Trans Mountain Pipeline, working to address issues surrounding housing affordability, finding solutions for the traffic congestion on the North Shore, and utilizing my role as Parliamentary Secretary for Science to help use innovation to grow the economy and solve important problems in fields like the environment or healthcare. Overarching all of these priorities is my goal to develop a strong relationship with our community that is based on trust. Because I believe that members of Parliament who develop trusting relationships with their community are the most effective advocates for them in the House of Commons. In that vein, I thought it was important to share with the community the work that we've been doing with regards to the Trans Mountain Project. I decided early on that the best way to be a strong advocate for you was to deeply understand the issue. And I first have to acknowledge that I wouldn't have been able to do this without the help of so many dedicated members of our community. I want to thank you for all the work that you've done over the last number of years. I've read through your reports, listened to your concerns at town halls and on the doorstep and drilled into your research. Your passion and hard work was crucial to my ability to strongly advocate on your behalf. For a number of individuals and organizations, and, and you know who you are, who helped me articulate a position on behalf of the residents of Burnaby and North Vancouver, I'd like to share with you that our work was considered, acknowledged, and acted upon by our Pacific Caucus, our Cabinet, and our Prime Minister. If you have not yet had an opportunity to read our report, I would suggest that you download a copy at our website, terrybeach-parl.ca. This is my best effort to be a substantial and articulate voice for the community on this issue. In fact, the Prime Minister acknowledged this in the statement that he made when he was making the announcement. And share the deep and abiding sense of responsibility British Columbians feel for our spectacular West Coast. Indeed, it is a personal issue for me. I spent much of my childhood with my grandparents on the coast and on the water. I worked and lived in BC for years as a teacher. Now I have heard and listened very carefully to the many diverse perspectives that exist in BC on this project. Indeed, one of its most articulate and substantive critics is a caucus colleague, Terry Beach. I believe that the quality of any decision is determined by the quality of the debate. And I am proud to be a part of a government who shares in this belief. Our cabinet is accessible and open to considering the concerns of our local communities. It works hard to balance the real economic, political, and environmental constraints that any government must operate under. We also have a Prime Minister who encourages his MPs to speak truth to power and advocate ferociously on behalf of our communities. I'm especially proud of this because I don't believe that I would have been given 
this same opportunity to voice our community concerns under the previous government. I'd like to take some time to share with you some of the details of how we work to understand our community's view and advocate on our community's behalf. After having done so much research on this issue, I was devastated when I first read the NEB report that was published in May of 2016. I just didn't understand how so many of our community's concerns could be absent from this report. Fortunately, Minister Carr had already announced the interim principles for national energy projects, which meant that Cabinet would not just consider the NEB report, but three additional documents as well. The first was a report by a special ministerial panel who would travel the entire route of the pipeline and the tanker route. The second was a review of the project's impact on greenhouse gas emissions. And finally, a joint federal and provincial consultation and accommodation report addressing our constitutional duty to consult Aboriginal groups. Knowing that the Ministerial Panel's report would be reviewed by Cabinet, I decided that I should make a presentation. To prepare for this, I conducted exhaustive primary and secondary research. I read every report. I did significant economic analysis. I put together a report on political support for every community and every level of government that is along the pipeline route or along the tanker route. Ravi and I packed up our truck and drove along the route all the way to Alberta talking to people all along the way. I attended six of the ministerial panel sessions, five in the Lower Mainland and one in Kamloops. I worked closely with my colleagues in Pacific Caucus. We held multiple town halls, coffee meetings and open houses. We kept knocking on doors. After the election, we were able to bring up our total doors knocked to 58,000. And we will continue knocking on doors as we move forward. I met with local councillors and mayors throughout the Lower Mainland, representatives of the Tsleil-Waututh, Musqueam and Squamish First Nations. I met with the Premier, the Prime Minister and thousands of local members of our community. People took us into their homes and organized get-togethers with their friends and neighbours, all of which informed the final version of our community's report. On August 19th, 2016, I made a 30-minute presentation and submitted an 18-page report that I felt best summed up the top 10 issues that were communicated to me during all of our public consultations, as well as it balanced the relevant economic and environmental arguments that I thought would be the most additive and impactful ideas to share with the panel. I was relieved when I found out that nine out of the ten concerns that I raised were featured prominently in the Ministerial Panel's report. We then sent out 44,000 surveys throughout the riding and used your feedback as well as the thousands of emails, letters, uh, phone calls to update the report into its final draft form. If you contacted us and we had your home address, you would have received a letter from me and uh, a full copy of this report. If not, you can download a full copy of the report from our website, terrybeach-parl.ca. On September 19th, the, uh, the day the, the fall session of Parliament commenced, I submitted my final version of the report to the panel and turned our attention to advocating on your behalf in Ottawa. Again, I would just like to say that I would highly recommend that you read a copy of this full report and it can be downloaded on my website at terrybeach-parl.ca. We sent a copy of this report to every member of Parliament along with an invite to meet with me one-on-one -on -one to discuss the importance of this issue to our community. At the end of the day, I was able to communicate our community's concerns to the vast majority of the Liberal Caucus. This included 
members of parliament, members of our cabinet, and in fact, the prime minister. I also work closely with members of our Pacific Caucus, which is a group exclusively made up of 17 Liberal members of Parliament from British Columbia. While this work and the details of this work uh, is conducted under caucus privilege, it is a working group that dedicated extensive time to advocating on British Columbia's behalf. And as an example, I would bring your attention to the work of one of my colleagues, Jonathan Wilkinson, who is both our neighbor and the Member of Parliament for North Vancouver. He also happens to be the Parliamentary Secretary for the Environment and Climate Change. He recently published a nine-page open letter which outlines many of the considerations that must be taken into account with regards to this project. You can find a copy of his letter on our website as well. <coughs> My office took a plan A, plan B approach with regards to advocating on this project. With plan A, we tried to advocate positions that were most supported by our community, primarily by looking at ways of, uh, of capturing uh, much of the economic benefits of this project while trying to minimize the environmental risk or economic costs. Uh, this included exploring the economics of finding an alternative route that didn't include the Burrard Inlet uh, and the possibility of potentially refining the product in Alberta. There is a, a tendency when discussing these issues to try and talk about uh, how to mitigate issues as it's involved with the project. But we specifically avoided these discussions because there is a risk that by working on a plan B you might actually be facilitating the project. That being said, I did add my voice, our voice, to specific projects that were good on their own merits. For example, on the Oceans Protection Plan, I pushed hard to ensure the plan didn't just talk about preserving the habitat, the habitat that we already have. I didn't want to just be hanging on to what we already have. I wanted to make sure that for the first time, that we were investing in restoring our coastline after decades of neglect. I also wanted to make sure that the plan included the leadership and partnership of our local First Nation communities. The relationship that, that I've started to build with these communities, especially with the Tsleil-Waututh First Nation, has been amongst uh, the most fulfilling of my first year in office. Um, the day before this decision was made, I was touring Chief Maureen Thomas and some of the Tsleil-Waututh youth on a tour of Parliament. This was the day before the decision was announced. And I reinforced, reinforced with them and to her my desire to continue to build our relationship regardless of the outcome of this decision. As, as fate would have it, I would be advised that the, uh, the very next day would be the day of the announcement and uh, that I would be attending a closed briefing with Pacific Caucus where uh, no electronic devices uh, were going to be allowed. Uh, at this meeting, we were briefed on the Cabinet's decision it was shortly before the announcement and then as a caucus we watched the announcement live on TV in that very same room. By the time I exited the briefing and got my phone back I had five outstanding media requests. At the time of recording this message I believe that we now have more than 40. But I decided that it would be best to reserve comment on the decision initially and return to the riding. After all, it was our constituents' input that provided so much of the substance of our report. It seemed only right that I would consult with the community prior to responding to a decision that had such a significant impact. 
the open house was well attended. It was about eight hours. I was able to meet with approximately 90 people. It was in small groups. We uh, went back and forth between a uh, boardroom and, and my office. And uh, sometimes we met as a small group and sometimes we met with individuals. We also you know, received a large number of uh, telephone calls, uh, email messages, letters, and tried to respond to as many as we could. Well, a few people expressed their support of the project, and uh, this is something, of course, that's happened throughout the process, and I don't want to discount those people that contacted my office in support. Uh, the, the vast majority, let's say, of individuals raised concerns. Families were worried about how this decision affects our climate change targets how we are working to prevent a potential oil spill. There was a number of health and safety concerns around diluted bitumen and the Burnaby Mountain storage tank facility. Of course, these are all valid concerns. And now that the broad strokes of our government's policy to balance economic growth with protection and restoration of the environment are starting to solidify, I believe it is now my job to determine how best to continue to advocate on behalf of our community within these policies. Many have also asked me about the possibility of legal action or protests. Canada is governed by the rule of law and the right to peaceful protest is protected by our charter. I fully support an individual fully exercising their democratic rights. In the same way that it is my responsibility to attend a Chamber of Commerce meeting to hear concerns about growing the economy or a, uh, a trade union meeting, to hear concerns about job creation, I believe it is also my job to hear about environmental concerns. This is why I have not been shy about attending events where groups criticize government's decision. It is, I believe it is my job to be there, to understand concerns and share those concerns with Ottawa. On climate change, for example, I dedicated an entire chapter in my report on the subject. I share the government's belief that climate change is one of the greatest challenges facing contemporary society. And it is my understanding, as a person who's been trained in developmental economics, that putting a price on carbon is the best chance we have to prevent the devastating impacts of a greater than two degree increase in global temperature. It is also my experience that successful precedent is the greatest facilitator of progressive public policy. The speed at which the tide of public opinion turned on a variety of issues from women's suffrage to uh, prohibition to same-sex marriage. These are all examples of a long-held policy status quo hitting a tipping point and then having the change spread at an, an astonishing pace. And I think that British Columbians should be proud that we set the precedent for pricing carbon pollution. Instituted in 2008, Revenue neutral carbon pricing reduced per person fuel uh, consumption in British Columbia by 18% while it increased by 3% throughout the rest of Canada. This happened while BC was building one of the country's fastest growing economies. The province's leadership is an undeniable success story that will now facilitate the implementation of putting a federal price on carbon pollution. In addition, pricing carbon pollution speeds up the timeline under which sustainable forms of energy will become cost efficient. This will give us a competitive advantage in building a clean energy sector that can establish a leadership position in the world, create new green jobs, and create a, tr uh, a trade surplus of green technology. We must demonstrate to the world that this type of policy can work while continuing to grow our economy, 
Only then can we export this policy throughout North America and Europe and begin to discuss the subject with emerging economies like India and China. In addition to expanding BC's leadership on pricing carbon pollution to a, a national scale, we are currently pursuing a number of environmental and economic policies, many of which would have seemed impossible to accomplish only a year and a half ago. We are investing $20 billion into green infrastructure. We are pursuing a pan-Canadian climate framework that includes putting a hard cap on Alberta's greenhouse gas emissions on the oil sands, something that environmentalists have been pursuing and requesting for years. We are putting together a plan along with the premiers of the provinces and territories to reduce our emissions to 30% below 2005 levels by 2030. We are implementing an Oceans Protection Plan that will begin for the first time ever to reverse years of neglect on our coast and will also work to restore our marine ecosystems. We are committed to the early phase out of coal fired electricity and we have worked to procure an international agreement to eliminate harmful hydrofluorocarbons or HFCs, something that I debated vigorously myself in the house only a number of months ago. In addition, put together a comprehensive plan that will articulate how we intend to meet our 2030 commitments and transition to a low carbon economy. And you have my personal commitment to hold everyone's feet to the fire to ensure that all 157 conditions are met or exceeded with regards to this project. As I stated in my report, taking care of this planet is a global optimization problem that must consider other national governments whose plans are currently at various stages of development. This is a problem and an opportunity that deserves the full attention of our government. And I would suggest that it is fair to say that this country has never had an environmental champion as strong as our current government. In the words of our Prime Minister, Canadians want us to build an economy that works for the middle class and protects our environment so we can leave a better, cleaner country to our kids. Voters rejected the old thinking that what is good for the economy is bad for the environment. They embrace the idea that we need strong environmental policies if we expect to de develop our natural resources and get them to international markets. And Canadians know that strong action on the environment is good for the economy. It makes us more competitive by fostering innovation and reducing pollution. Canadians value clean air and water, beautiful coasts and wilderness, and refuse to accept that they must be compromised in order to create growth. And I couldn't agree more. And I believe it is my responsibility to ensure that our government delivers on this commitment. I will always be a strong advocate for our community and work to leave a cleaner and more prosperous country to our kids than the one that we inherited from our parents. I invite everyone in our community to reach out to my office and to meet with me personally to discuss any further concerns or questions that you might have. Indeed, there is still a lot of hard work to be done. And I want to thank you for your time, for your support, and for your good wishes. And most of all, thank you for listening.